Hello and welcome to the Red Lodge, Bristol's hidden gem. It's an original Tudor Lodge built in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. I'm here today to meet the curator Karen Walton to find out more about this fascinating building. And I'm especially interested in the men and women who once lived here. Now if you'd care to join me, don't be surprised if we run into some friendly ghosts of the former owners as our story unfolds. I'm now standing in the Knot Garden. This garden is all that's left of the extensive gardens and orchards that once stretched from the back of this property down to where Bristol's Colston Hall now stands. This garden's been recreated in the style of a herb garden, as it would have looked in around about the year 1630. But the story that we're tracing today begins about a hundred years before the 1630s. It begins in the reign of Henry VIII in the 1530s, and it concerns the events that happened when he cast off his Queen Catherine of Aragon and married Anne Boleyn. Now let's meet our expert, Karen Walton, to find out a bit more. Hello, Hello Karen. Thank you. Karen, when does the story of the Red Lodge really begin? Well, I suppose really in 1538 and thereabouts when Henry VIII breaks with Rome, the monasteries are dissolved and a lot of church land is sold off, including the Carmelite monastery which occupied most of the land around us here. And then in 1568, it's, well, some of the land and buildings are bought by a uh, certain John Brown. So it was bought by somebody called John Young. That's right. John, uh, at that time, had been about 48. Uh, he'd held various offices at the Court of Henry VIII uh, and had been a member of Parliament for various constituencies. And then under Queen Elizabeth, uh, he becomes collector of the customs for Bristol, which was a very lucrative post. But he was allowed to delegate the duties because he was much about the Queen's business which I suspect means he was on diplomatic missions. So was he a spy? Was he, a, <laughs> was he an Elizabethan quite, spy? Quite possibly, but I don't think we really know. Um, but uh, in, he built himself a rather grand house called the Great House on St Augustine's Back, which was at the bottom of the gardens that he just walked through. And when Queen Elizabeth comes to Bristol in 1574, she stays at the Great House. She stays for a week, and it wasn't just her, of course, she didn't have any arms and retinue. So it was a very expensive business, uh, but he got his reward at the end because she wanted him. Oh, so John Young. She was a wealthy widow with children from a previous marriage, wasn't she? That's right. Uh, and then she had another three children by John. In fact, when her husband died, he'd been in rather financial difficulties. Mm. Uh, and it took a while for John to get control of her estates, which were in Dorset, and get them back. And then slowly we find him build, buying up more land around this, this great house uh, until he becomes a very influential property in Bristol. Um, at, uh, at some stages with a rivalry with the Smith family of Ashton Court. Rivalry? Uh, rivalry, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and it ended up with um, skirmishes on um, <laughs> College Green. Um, but John dies in 1589. Uh, his wife goes on living in the house, but uh, the property is inherited by his son, Robert. I understand that Robert was a bit of a jack of the lad. He, um, he turned out to be somewhat of a reckless character, didn't he, Cal? Yes, he did. Uh, he got through his inheritance rather quickly. Um, very spendthrift ways. Uh, at one stage, he has to mortgage the Red Lodge in order to protect it from his creditors. Um, in the end, he has to 
um, flee to Ireland, basically, as a soldier of fortune to escape his creditors. Uh, and he sells the Red Lodge to his half brother, Nicholas Strange. Oh, right. Now, he was another one who had problems with debt, wasn't he? Yes. And from what I could see, a lot of leasing of the lodge took place over the next 25 years. But then I did come across a significant date in my research, which was 1628, when the lodge seems to have been sold again to Derek Popley. Yes, as you say, it was sold to Derek Popley for the princely sum of £650, which was rather less than it was advertised for, so he got a bargain. But he only lives in it for five years because he dies in 1633. Right. Derek was quite an influential man. He uh, was a member of the prestigious Society of Merchant Ventures. He was sheriff of Bristol in 1630. Uh, but he had the misfortune to invest in a couple of ships which were captured by the Turks and he lost a lot of money. Now, although Derek Popley was this eminent Bristol citizen, wasn't he? He, was. he wasn't above a bit of shady business dealing by what I read. No, that's right. Um, he was well, he was accused of smuggling. Uh, smuggling smuggler. Smuggler, <laughs> smuggling Malaga wine and raisins and butter. Uh, and also in 1630 he was actually sheriff of the city. Uh, he was uh, in prison for forcing up the price of salt in the sunset. Oh, by buying more than he was entitled to. Uh, but he's interesting to us because he his will leaves gives us just a slight glimpse of what the Red Lodge must have looked like. Right. It, um, it doesn't give us a room by room picture, unfortunately, but it lists all the important items. So we know there were uh, various four posted beds hung with blue serge, with green and yellow taffeta, uh, with a red material, white with blue uh, fabric. He had. Um, several, or at least two, cypress wood chests, which were exotic uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a script wall or a writing desk. Uh, there were brass, gleaming brass fire irons in the fireplaces. But most interesting of all, this is a silver, because there was an enormous amount, or comparatively enormous amount of yes. silver. He had several sets of silver gilt and silver cooking bowls, silver ewers and basins, a silver gilt salt cellar, um, various sets of silver spoons, if we're reading 12 apostle spoons. So it was, all, it was obviously a very wealthy household. Right, but I read something about Derek Popley. I found this story very amusing. His young widow, the very night he died, didn't she smuggle a lot of jewellery and silver plate and things out of the Red Lodge in a trunk? So I believe. So we believe. <laughs> Now, we don't seem to have a painting of Derek Popley or of his son, who is also called Derek. But, Karen, this painting here is a painting from the time of the English Civil War, isn't it, in the 17th century? Yes, this is a portrait of Robert Yeamans, who has no direct connection with the house, although he may have been related to the Popleys. But he's a reminder of that turbulent period in English history, uh, the Civil War, when the Roundheads and Royalists were fighting. So in 1660, of course, the restoration of the monarchy took place, and the very monarch, Charles II, came to the English throne. Now, I understand that Charles II actually bestowed a knighthood on Derek Popper the Younger, didn't he, Calvin? He did, and Derek bought himself a coat of arms to go with it, uh, but then he disappeared off to Spain and the house of Sorry again. So, in fact, in the history of the Red Lodge, it's never been owned by more than two generations of the same family. That's right, and I think that's quite unusual for a house of this age. Um, the house is now bought by Robert Henley, a London merchant. And didn't Robert Henley have some association with the monarch Charles II as well? well in a roundabout way, yes. Uh, he was, well, he'd obviously offended the Bristol's ruling elite, and he was falsely accused of taking part in the Rye House plot to assassinate Charles II and his brother James. As for poor Mr. Henley, I most heartily lament the cloud that seems to hang over his head. Though I think verily both his honesty and prudence have been too great to bring him into further trouble than what he is exposed to, by the misrepresentations of those who understand him not. 
Oh. Um, I thought I heard something then. These portraits are of John Henley and of his wife, Mary Flynn. Now, John Henley inherits the Red Lodge in 1710. He's in his 50s, and his wife is young enough to be his daughter. They're a childless couple, but their period of ownership is important because of the renovations that they carry out. Now, they put in the magnificent staircase, they put a gable on the roof, and crucially, they extended the ground floor of the lodge to create the large, spacious, sunny salon. In 1732, John Henley died, and I asked Karen, what happened next? What happened when John Henley died? What happened to his young, pretty widow? Uh, well, she went on for another 40 years or so, but she remarried. She married the Dean of Bristol, Dr. Simon Creswick, and then she followed him round on his career. Uh, so the house was let to various cousins uh, until it comes to one Henry Goodwin. So I read that Henry Goodwin then, in turn, he goes on to sell the Red Lodge in 1783 to a wealthy woolen draper by the name of William Trotman. Yes, having failed to sell it as a site for an extension to the Bristol Royal Infirmary, uh, because the neighbours objected, uh, he then sells it to uh, Trotman. centuries, I understand that it provided a platform for some illustrious figures. Yes, it was uh, two surgeons from the Bristol Royal Infirmary uh, set up a series of lectures here on anatomy uh, and also played host to the Disputation Society which welcomed speakers like Coleridge uh, and Sully and poets and uh, Dr Thomas Bedos. And then that's not the only time that the house plays a very small part in the advancement of, of science, because in 1827, uh, James Carl's Pritchard and his wife Maria and their ten children take <laughs> residence. Ten, ten children. children <laughs> says, um, Pritchard was a, a physician at the Royal Infirmary, did a lot of research into what we would now call dementia, uh, but wrote a very influential book called The Natural History of Man, which for a few years afterwards, was thought to foreshadow the work of Darwin. But I don't think we are giving that much credit nowadays. Um, Pritchard is then uh, goes up to London, uh, and his son, Augustine, who is also a surgeon and an eye specialist, uh, lives here for a while. So the Red Lodge has played its part in medical science. <laughs> also served a use as a school on a number of occasions, hasn't it? Yes, the first time was in the early 1800s when it was an academy for young ladies. Uh, when we uh, rewired the house some years ago and took the floorboards up actually in this room, uh, we found a series of exercise books dating from that period. Um, but I think probably more significant was the um, social experiment that began in 1854 with the arrival of Miss Mary Carpenter. Uh, she was a formidable lady uh, with pioneering ideas on how to treat young offenders. And she set up a reform school for girls and boys at Kingswood near Bath, but decided that the, particularly the older girls, were causing too much disruption, so that it would be better to set up a separate school for girls. 
Uh, she looked around for somewhere to, to do this. The Red Lodge happened to be on the market at the time uh, and was acquired for her by her um, friend, Lady Byron. Karen, didn't Mary Carpenter have revolutionary ideas about women's education as well? Oh yes, yeah, she was a great uh, pioneer in that field and at the age of 59 uh, she embarked on the first of four visits to India where she su um, supported a campaign for women's education. And for suffrage. And for suffrage and for the rights of prisoners as well. An amazing lady. Mm -hmm. Amazing grace she showed. Troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While you the Lucifer to light your flag, smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. The closure of Mary Carpenter's Reform School in 1917 brings the story of the Lodge to the tail end of World War I. This was the time in its history when it faced the greatest threat ever to its preservation. If it had been sold, the magnificent artefacts would have been stripped out and most likely sold off to American collectors who were clamouring for Elizabethan artefacts. That didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was because of this gentleman here, Alderman James Eberle. Alderman Ebony set up a fund to save the lodge and he was aided by a very generous donation from good old Sir George Wills of the famous Wills tobacco family. They managed to buy the lodge and in 1920 they presented it to the City of Bristol. Now the City of Bristol leased it out to a society of artists and entertainers called the Bristol Savages. And then in 1948, when Bristol City Museum took over the management of this property, the Bristol Savages moved out but they didn't lose their headquarters. They did something very clever. They moved into the garden and they built a special meeting room called the Wigwam. And the Bristol Savages still meet in the Wigwam at the Red Lodge to this very day. So for more than 430 years, a fascinating collection of people have owned, lived in and worked at the Red Lodge. The great oak panelled room where I'm standing now is one of the last surviving Elizabethan domestic interiors in Bristol. Apart from the windows which were altered later, everything you see of the fixtures and fittings is original to the house. So the oak panelling, the cardboard porch, uh, the plasterwork ceiling and the wonderful and carved stone chimney piece and its alabaster in the sense. And with the chimney, doesn't the chimney have some significance, Karen, with regard to possibly North America? Well, it has, uh, both the chimneys and the porch actually, have um, obviously foreign-looking figures. Uh, whether they're North American or not, I'm not quite sure, but they certainly probably give us some indication of Bristol's trading links. And Karen, can I just ask you, are the figures on the fireplace, do they represent anything in particular? Uh, yes, we have four of the virtues up there. Hope, charity, justice... Prisons? and. Prudence. Prudence. Hope, charity, <laughs> justice, justice and prudence. prudence. Karen, thank you so much for unfolding this unexpected and completely engrossing story of the Lodge to me. I'd simply never have guessed, judging at the drab exterior walls of this building, that there could be such an Aladdin's cave waiting to be discovered inside. 
Now the Red Lodge is easy to visit, being located near central Bristol on Park Row. It's a stone's throw from Bristol City Museum and it's next to Trenchard Street Car Park. Admission is free, it makes for a super family trip and it's open from Easter until the end of October every year. For more information, why not take a look at www.bristol.gov.uk forward slash museums. I'm Theresa Roach. It's given me such pleasure to share the secret of Bristol's hidden gem with you today. And finally, I'd just like to say a very big thank you to all our magnificent ghosts for giving us a glimpse into the world they once lived in.